Welcome to the Holly Bridges podcast. My name is Holly and this is part one of a two-part podcast looking at some truly exciting and inspirational stories of breakthroughs in autism. Tonight we are talking about the most up-to-date changes in autism therapy and how we can make significant improvements in the lives of people with autism. Believe it or not, autism affects almost 1 in 70 Americans and there are similar patterns emerging in developed countries worldwide. Here in Australia, the diagnosis has risen by nearly 80% in the last 30 years. And while the diagnosis has increased, sadly, the strategies and approaches to autism have roughly stayed the same. That is till now. Tonight, we have some leaders at the forefront of these new and thrilling autism treatments. My name is Holly Bridges. I am the author of Reframe Your Thinking Around Autism. And my guests are... Dr. Randy Beck from the Institute of Functional Neuroscience. You cannot have a controlled, randomized trial when you're talking about humans. When you expand someone's environmental adventures, they invariably are proud. Dr. Sanjeev Sharma, holistic psychiatrist. We talk about holistic approaches in every field of medicine, but we don't really do it. Dr. John Lorne, psychiatrist and trauma specialist. They want to have personalised treatments for everything for, so that you're not just having a generic sort of cookie-cutter approach. And Mike House, survival and disability expert. Staying open-minded, for me, a big part of the picture is, is just remaining curious. Thank you for joining us. And if you want to know more, you can find great resources on my website. Just Google Holly Bridges. And don't forget to subscribe to this podcast to hear future editions. So first up, I would like to introduce Dr. Randy Beck. Randy, could you tell us about you and your work? Right. Um, I'm the uh, director of the Institute of Functional Neuroscience. And uh, basically what we do is uh, applied clinical neuroplasticity. So we take the current research that is uh, available and apply it clinically to help people with various conditions, uh, including one which is autism, ADHD, global developmental delay, that type of thing. So we're um, really trying to um, take the information that's available in the research world or in the uh, evidence-based world and try to apply it to actual people. That's really what we're trying to do. We've been doing this now for about uh, 12 years, something like that. So we're now approaching tens of thousands of patients, I suppose, that we've uh, been able to uh, apply this type of therapy to. Dr. Sanjeev Sharma, Sanjeev, welcome. Thank you. Could you tell us, so you're doing holistic psychiatry and with autism? Yeah, I work both in public and private uh, system in WA. And in the last few years, uh, I have a special interest in addiction psychiatry. And that's where majority of my work is. And I've realized that a lot of times, we talk about holistic approaches in every field of medicine, but we don't really do it. And uh, in the last few years, I have started using some integrative approaches, particularly using epi epigenetic work uh, in the area of neurosciences, particularly mental illness, as and started working on their methylation profile, gut biome profile and making adjustments and I've seen some huge success rates and seen that people who were initially treatment resistant have now become treatment responsive and which is was initially a quite a big of surprise to me because I was myself skeptical when I launched into this area because it was a completely new area where not much my colleagues have been doing but when I met some interesting people who have been doing work in this area have seen some exciting. Now I can confirm that, yes, I have got few success stories in my books as well. So <laughs> I have no doubts that this modality does work. <laughs> Thank you, Sanjeev. Dr. Lorne, welcome. Would you like to tell us a little about your work? Um, sure, yeah. I mean, I'm another psychiatrist like Sanjeev. Sanjeev. Um, uh, I work mainly with adults, but some children. And I've, um, I've got a particular interest in anxiety and trauma-related problems, uh, PTSD, but other issues as well across the age span. 
and I've got a broad interest in all sorts of different treatment approaches I suppose quite open-minded in that regard I use a lot of a lot of non-medication type treatments acupressure that kind of thing um, so what you might call complementary or slightly left of center type treatments but it's amazing how many of them are starting to develop an evidence base themselves um, and more recently as well as my work at UWA and Fremantle Hospital I do more and more private practice which is something I'm developing in the next few months and I've started consulting at the Institute of Functional Neuroscience so I'm quite excited to be moving forward um, learning from the work that they're doing there but also hopefully adding to, to what they're doing across the age range and that includes uh, working with uh, children with autism and related disorders. Yep. Thank you. Yep, thanks. Mike House. Would you like to introduce yourself, please? Sure. Thanks for the invite, Holly. Uh, so I'm a survival specialist. I, at one level, take people out into the outback and teach them what to do if they're lost or stranded, which is um, seemingly quite <laughs> different to what the rest of the room is is full of. And I've spent a bit of time as well working with uh, lots of different organisations and individuals in all sorts of sectors, and uh, about 20 years doing change kinds of oriented things in the disability sector as well. So it's a pretty diverse spread. And I guess for me, the link between all of those things is that you know, I'm fascinated by the way people respond to pressure, how, how we as a human entity deal with uncertainty and um, decisions and change and newness, and also the, the way that we filter and perceive the information around us really influences what goes on and you know, part of my observation with uh, people with disabilities generally is that they're, they're often constrained by the perceptions of the people around them. Um, so some of my work's been around just challenging that, you know, how we, how we see people, how we see environments and quite often that leads to some really interesting awareness around what people can actually do when the, when the boxes around them are taken away. Thank you. I might just carry on from that because it's quite interesting and, and we've gone around the circle, but it's the outward perception is, is such a constraint, but it also then promotes an inner perception which drives all sorts of thinking capacity and reception to the world. So it would be quite interesting if there's, in a sense, some stories from some of you about what you see when you start playing with, I use the word playing because that's how I think, um, with people with autism and you start stretching out their self-perceptions, you start stretching out the perceptions of the people around them and then watch just how much they can actually grow. And, and for me, the thing is that people with autism have an unlimited capacity to grow and heal is one word, although some people um, don't like that word so much. But Randy, could you talk a little bit about your work in, in terms of perhaps the, the profound changes that you've seen with some people in, in the autism spectrum? Look, I, th I think it's really interesting that the very first thing that, that uh, this group talks about is the environment. And you are absolutely correct that this, the environment actually drives brain development. And if that environmental reception or perception is altered, it alters the way the mind develops. And uh, there's some very, very interesting work now. I mean, and of course, we've been talking about this for 10 years now when it wasn't sexy to do it. Uh, but now there's a lot of uh, work coming out of John Hopkins, uh, uh, some of our uh, colleagues at Harvard, doing work with interesting ways of changing environmental perception and seeing how that affects people. So I'll give you an example. Using uh, peyote or mescaline, which changes your perception of your environmental input to treat depression. And they're now realizing that people with depression have an altered sense of their environmental perception. And that's why they have, that's one of the reasons why they have depression. Now, uh, autism, we're finding several different types of autism. And that's why I don't say autism anymore, I say autisms because there are many more than just the, the one category that we often think of. But one of those, or two or three of those categories are majorly impacted by environmental changes in perception. So these kids basically, because of a lack, something happens probably around the age of 18 to 24 months in which their environmental system changes. 
So their perceptive mechanism changes, the perception in their brain changes. They now don't have the capacity to build an environmental picture of their surroundings. So they make it up. Their, the brain actually starts creating its own. And it's flashing in and out of the internally created environment to our environment that we see these abrupt uh, changes in some of these kids. So for instance, uh, you know, parents say to me all the time, oh my God, I saw a brief glimpse of my child. They were there for about 30 seconds and then they're gone again. And that's them coming into our world. See, in their world, they know all the rules. They know what feels good. They know what everything means. But when they come into our world, it's, it's scary. So what we try to do with the environmental stimulus approach is to remind the brain what environmental stimulus was supposed to feel like and how it's supposed to be used. And when we start doing that, the way I look at this is that they start coming into our world more often and they start staying there longer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll let someone else have a go now, but I'm, that's... Mike, you were telling me a story a while ago about a camp you were on mm. and um, one of the guys at cooking. And I thought, I mean, it, it's drawing on from what Randy's talking about, but it it wasn't illuminating for me. I've seen it before, but I loved it. And I think it, it is illuminating for a lot of people because people get very fixed on what they think mm. people can do and, and what they can achieve, if you don't mind telling it again. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I guess it, it fits in with... Uh, Part of the work that I've done is to take people into environments that typically in our current sort of culture and climate people would say that person can't go there, it's not safe, they're not capable, whatever, and, and a lot of those environments have been outdoor or camp-based environments and, and doing activities that are considered to be you know, reasonably out of the box. So we've done things like you know, abseiling, caving, bushwalking, whitewater rafting, uh, just heading into different towns and staying overnight and all of that. And the particular story you're referring to, one of the young guys that came along with us, his parents and a lot of the people, support people around him assessed him as basically someone not particularly capable of looking after himself. And on this camp, I cooked on the barbecue a bacon and egg breakfast uh, on the first morning that we were there. And on the second morning, this guy woke us up at 5 a.m. and he'd basically cooked breakfast for the about 15 people on camp. And it was the first time that he'd ever done that. And he'd, he'd done it essentially from watching me do it once, hadn't asked me anything about it. He'd basically got himself up, started the barbecue, found all the stuff in the fridge, uh, cooked the food, and then came and woke us up and said, breakfast is ready, you know? So, that it was just an incredible example of when you take people into a different environment and a different space where the expectations around them are different they'll often rise to a really different standard of what possible is and then from there there's all kinds of things that start to become available to them and the people around them and, and what you three would probably all say is that changes their neurology in respects as well and if you can actually maintain that you've got a you've got a different person haven't you? you've got a much more capable person did you want to expand on that perhaps Tom? yeah sure i mean it's it's fascinating isn't it and i think this is what's exciting about a lot of the stuff that's happening now um in neuroscience and what we're learning generally which i'm sure the others would like to comment on as well but um i think what we're realizing is how powerful this interaction between um each of our Neuro neurologies is if you like so a lot of these examples of things that are going on to different degrees are examples of how we interact with each other quite powerfully so even just doing good old-fashioned therapy if you're a good therapist i mean a lot of the evidence is that in therapy generally psychotherapy um the most powerful factors are non-specific factors then whichever type of therapy you're doing if you're able to have a very good alliance with another human being a lot happens um, and you know, people try to analyse that endlessly, but I think from a neuroscience point of view, there's a, there's a lot going on now in terms of our understanding of the interaction between two nervous systems, just like the way we're talking around the table now. Uh, and of course that relates back to nurturing as kids, how we learn processes, how we interact with our mothers and so on, eye contact and non-verbal things that are very intuitive and non, not conscious. So all of these situations involve this and also the work people do with animals is an interesting one because sometimes some 
youngsters can interact more effectively with an animal's nervous system than another human beings at certain stages and hence the use of horses in therapy and, and other animals can be very effective which sort of leads on to things like polyvagal theory which I know you're very interested in and in how parts of our non-conscious nervous system are very important in this process so I think all this, this is really really interesting we could talk at length but maybe let someone else jump in on that and it's very much though the nervous system being in a certain state allows a greater or lesser access to your brain capacity, your social capacity, all of that. And, and I guess everyone here is playing with that more or less. Sanjeev, you're taking it much more from the body angle with your holistic stuff. Can you talk a bit more about how you said you had some profound experiences watching people change? Could you talk about that a little bit? Like in a traditional psychiatry approach, first of all, we all try to put psychiatric diagnosis in a box of either DSM-5 now and ICD-10. And uh, although it was a good concept to begin with, like we had, because the way psychiatric diagnosis evolved, we need to have some classificatory system. Now, and I was part of that training as well. So it's not, mind you, I don't say that these classificatory systems have not done their job. They have done a wonderful job even including psychiatric medications have saved a lot of lives. But what is happening now is, and I always say to my colleagues, is that if you are a true student of science, then based on evidence presented in front of you, your opinion about something should change. Which some, I think a lot of people look for an evidence-based practice. And I always say evidence don't land from Mars and moons. It starts from your clinical practice. If you have found something, just put it in your day-to-day -day practice and then see whether you see a change, then maybe look for some other colleagues who would believe in your concept and then a gradually a study or a research can be planned. A lot of times there are standard benchmarks of research, like for example, randomized control trial, where we're trying to control a lot of variables but our body is not like that. Okay, we we ninety nine point nine percent of our DNA resembles, but point one makes a difference. And this is the DNA which we are talking about. Okay, what about the biome which we are carrying within us? Okay, and now it is proven that the biome is ten times more than our own cells, and genome is almost hundred times. So that makes a huge difference when it comes to the interventions. I've seen that. Could I ask you just um, for our listeners to explain the biome very quickly? Sure. So some people who don't know what that means. Uh, as we all know, now the research has been coming up that our gut is not a sterile place. Okay. Even when the child is conceived, there is an interaction which from the mother's placenta, including the uh, amniotic fluid, the child is exposed to certain uh, bacteria or the environment in which the child is growing. Especially when the child is born, particularly if it is a normal vaginal delivery, you get a first seeding of the bacteria which lives mainly in the large part of our intestine. And in reality, about one and a half to two kilos of our weight is actually bugs in our gut. Their numbers outnumbers our cells by 10 times and their DNA outnumbers by 100 times. So in reality, we are living in them rather than they living in us. So this is where the current research doesn't look into. And there will be no research which can be ever done where it can identify the various variables around it. So in my practice, what I've started doing and in the last few years is that looking into just scratching the surface about their metabolism patterns, how they are, whether they are micronutrient status, and also looking into the uh, some gut biome testing, which is available. Some of it is available in Australia. We are quite fortunate enough. And simply based on that, I make certain alterations in the dietary changes. That doesn't mean that I'm stopping the medication which the patient has been taking. What I always use nutraceutical agents as an adjunct to the medications. When we do these kind of approaches, then the chances are you are making a change in their environment, as Randy was talking about. 
And once you make a change in the environment, then I think our body has got a resilience capacity to rebound back to its normal state. And this is what where we our current approaches are lacking because we are always looking for an evidence till when it arrives on our doorstep, then only will change. But chances are by the time things would be quite late. <laughs> Very much so. If you if you look at the gut and you're changing the gut and you're changing the energetic structure, do you see the polyvagal theory or how do you explain perhaps the for people who are listening, if if you've got autism and you then you change the gut structure, the microbiome structure, how does that translate to someone being more adept or more socially able or how do you see that? What? How do they sort of exhibit it? But then how do you explain the connection? And I guess for me, I go down the polyvagal road. I can give you an example of a family friend's daughter who is now five or six years old. This is a young kid who had problems with the speech. And once again, in the mainstream school, she was, she was part of the bunch. And... Uh, Parents were quite proactive seeing the other kids that why she's not performing. She was taken to the general practitioner and then subsequently referred to a, a huge waiting list of developmental pediatrician, which takes, I think I have more than 18 to two years, months to two years, public, particularly in the public system. And eventually gave, got a diagnosis of what they call as autism spectrum disorders. So, so, and then there was a package designed for her, including some speech therapy and occupational therapy. And when that, that family friend came to me, I had few colleagues in Perth who, who were doing uh, particularly work with the young, young children, and especially with autism. So I just gave them a suggestion that, do you mind trying some of these new concepts which are coming up, which will include certain blood tests, including some stool tests, and, and then she might be requiring some dietary changes and nutraceutical supplements. Now, coming back to your question about how the polyvagal theory would have an impact. Now, we all know that there is a 10th cranial nerve, which is called as the vagus nerve, supply the whole of the gut. Okay. And once we make a change in the environment in which this vagus communicate with our brain, then the chances are that you will see some changes in their behavior. Now, this girl which I'm talking about, uh, I don't want to go into specific details, but one of the problems was that she could not sleep at night. Okay. Another issue was that she was, her speech was not very clear. Okay. Now, once we made a change in the environment, I guess, particularly her diet, then not only her speech improved, because what is happening is that like, you are changing a structure where her vagus is not, is quietened down, like it's not on an alert mode all the time. And then when any intervention, like particularly which Randy is talking about, Mark is talking about, then the chances are that those interventions efficacy will increase several folds when you give that brain a right environment. And there is an intimate connection between brain and gut. And that's why our gut is called as a second brain. So we talk about our primary brain, but the secondary brain is often ignored. And within span of about four to six months now, this girl has started speaking clearly. She can sleep well. Now, the treatment team involved in her care are reasonably convinced that yes, there is a remarkable improvement. But when the parents were trying to uh, explain the topic about making a dietary changes and how supplements, I think, People often ignore that those aspects because majority of the time either they don't believe it or even if they do believe they they would say they have not seen some optimal results it's quite a new language for us really to start talking about the gut and the brain it's it's becoming and, and neuroplasticity things that a lot of people make sense to a lot of people but they still don't make sense to a lot of other people do you want to expand on that a bit more um, from where Sanjeev was Absolutely. Uh, look, I think that uh, once you wrap your head around the fact that the nervous system, the immune system, the hormonal system, and the uh, system of emotions are all one system, 
we have split them apart so over the years so that we could sort of attempt to understand them, I think. But I think we need to always come back to the fact that they're all one system. If you have a brain problem, you have a gut problem. If you have a gut problem, you have a brain problem. If you have a brain problem, you have an immune system problem. If you have an immune system problem, you have a brain problem. Once you accept that, everything makes sense. It's trying to fight it, and, and people fight it for years and years and years until they suddenly realize, whoa, uh, that's actually the way it works. Now, once you get over that, then you can start seeing how everything is connected. So the polyvagal theory, the connection between all of the autonomic nerves and the brain is the brainstem. So that brainstem has, over evolution, developed massive systems of intercommunication. And they mostly are fancy terms called pontomedullary reticular formation and the mesencephalic reticular formation. I mean, these things will put you to sleep if you try to say these words. But the point is, those systems are there. We never understood them. You know, in lots of, uh, I've taught in lots of medical school classes, I've taught in lots of uh, uh, allied health classes, and people just go to sleep when you start talking about this stuff. But the fact is, that's probably the most important lecture of their life that they should have listened to because that is the connection. So when we talk about brain activity and how autonomic systems and gut systems and immune systems, see, they, the immune system is connected through the autonomic system, through the sympathetic system. The gut is connected through the vagus system. It's all a glorious, absolutely perfect miracle that all this stuff comes together. Can you extrapolate on that in terms of autism? Absolutely. So the, uh, again, the way we perceive our environment, especially at the, I strongly believe there's a critical phase or a critical period in development. And if you don't meet certain milestones, things just don't work right after that. And I think that truly is the coming together of the immune system input, gut input, uh, and brain development, environmental stimulus. So if you don't have those three coming at the appropriate time and the appropriate amount, things don't work right. So that will develop into a variety of different outward symptoms of the, of the people that are involved. So global developmental delay, autistic, spe autistic spectrum disorder. Um, then we get into the other uh, sort of psychosis type things where brain doesn't work properly. So we can relate with the fact that a schizophrenic's environmental perception is different than ours, but we can't relate that an autistic child's is, or a kid with ADHD, or you know, a kid with uh, an immune system problem. So we have to get back to understanding that all of these systems are not only interconnected, but they are one. And as soon as you understand that and believe that and look at research from that point of view, and like Sanjay was saying, you cannot, have, you cannot have a controlled randomized trial when you're talking about humans. There is not one human in, I mean, all of us in this room, we could all say, yes, we're all, you know, we've all got autism, but guess what? We're all different types of autism. So when we measure that research result and we put it through the rigorous statistics that we put it through, guess what? There's no change because we're all different. We weren't the same sample. So again, you're, you're, he's absolutely correct. Our research approach to this type of clinical challenge has to change. You've been listening to Holly Bridges' podcast. We continue this discussion in Breakthroughs in Autism in part two. And you can find more on my website, just Google Holly Bridges. And don't forget to subscribe to this podcast for future editions. Welcome to the Holly Bridges podcast. My name is Holly and this is part two of a two-part podcast looking at breakthroughs in autism. Tonight we have an exciting panel of experts talking about the amazing changes you can bring about when you move away from the traditional behavioural therapies of autism and you begin to apply the latest thinking in neuroscience and holistic health. Believe it or not, Autism affects almost 1 in 70 Americans, and there are similar patterns emerging in developed countries worldwide. Here in Australia, the diagnosis has risen by nearly 80% in the last 30 years, and while the diagnosis has increased, the treatment has largely stayed the same. That is till now. My name is Holly Bridges, and I am the author of Reframe Your Thinking Around Autism, 
And my guests tonight are Dr. Randy Beck from the Institute of Functional Neuroscience. Unfortunately, when you actually look at the evidence, a lot of these therapies don't stand up. Dr. Sanjeev Sharma, holistic psychiatrist. Those interventions' efficacy will increase several folds when you give that brain a right environment. Dr. John Lorne, psychiatrist and trauma specialist. But to see the change in both the child and also the family members, that was very convincing for me. And Mike House, survival and disability expert. Part of my observation with people with disabilities generally is that they're, they're often constrained by the perceptions of the people around them. Thank you for joining us. If you want to know more, you can find great resources on my website, just Google Holly Bridges. And don't forget to subscribe to this podcast for future editions. Everyone in this room, in their various ways, really likes playing with the dynamism that is autism as opposed to very limited outcomes-focused therapies. John, can you talk a bit about outcomes that you have in your practice or seen working with people with autism from taking a more vital approach? Well, I'm not as experienced working with autism as some of the other people around the table, I must admit. But what I have seen, particularly in my work um, more recently, <clears throat> uh, working alongside Randy at his institute, is um, some quite, well, some very impressive changes and particularly talking as well to some of the parents who've seen dramatic changes in their own children. So they're often the best witness to results, if you want to talk about results, because they live with these individuals day to day. So it's a very different kind of uh, perspective. But it's actually one of the things that actually drew me in to becoming more involved with the Institute was um, realising the impact it was having on, on some of these children that, that this treatment approach was having, but also the impact it was having on the families. So obviously we're all very aware of the very negative impact these kinds of problems can have on families. But to see the change in both you know, the, the child and also the family members, the parents and so on, and the siblings, that was very convincing for me. So, <clears throat> and I won't speak a great deal about the actual treatments because Randy's really the expert on those, but I mean, they are, as you say, treatments that are not the usual, but they are as evidence-based as probably anything in this field. Um, and they are based in a very sort of scientific, rigorous scientific way of looking at things, which is based around this idea of the whole system, as we just talked about. Um, and utilising what you might call a range of, of interventions, which will have a, a modification of environment or modification of stimulation approach. So everything from basic exercises through to more sophisticated peripheral stimulation using electricity <laughs> in a modified sense, nothing too dramatic, but sort of um, you know, peripheral electrical stimulation and so on. Um, but all guided by both the clinical picture, but also uh, tests such as EEG, qualitative EEG, which is a sort of brain mapping approach. And what I love about this is it's personalised to the individual. So and I think this is where it is, it's, it's quite difficult to evaluate in a sort of randomised control trial because it's such personalised medicine. But that, that's interesting because personalised medicine is a bit of a buzz term in medicine nowadays. That's what, where people want to get to. They want to have personalised treatments for everything for, so that you're not just having a generic sort of cookie cutter approach. And I think that this approach that the Institute is using is really starting to make that happen, particularly not just for autism, a range of problems, but for autism in particular. And it's working. Yeah. So I think that's exciting. Yeah. I've recently been working with a 29-year-old woman um, and we've done a sort of a second phase of things. Um, in six weeks, she can fully look in the mirror and she hasn't been able to do that for her whole life. And we very personalised, made up all sorts of things. We've been doing eye dancing to Taylor Swift songs and just a whole lot of stuff so that she can begin to feel and integrate her perception with what's going on with her system until she can regulate it enough. And the last day we we got her, we, we built up with small mirrors and different things and, and how that would register everywhere. And then the last day she could stand um, with her back to the full mirror, but still felt completely queasy and awful. Um, so we went back and sort of settled her as she knows how very well now. And then she could stand and, and just look and really appreciate that and her entire system was calm and it was a huge thing for her to be able to do and 
I imagine that that will extrapolate to all sorts of other aspects of her world. I'd really like Mike to come back to you in a minute, but Randy, could you talk a bit about the different types of therapies? I mean, I think there's there's such a range of things you can do to enhance people's capacity and perception and self-perception, etc., to awaken their system. Is that a way a term you would use? Or yeah, absolutely. Like the the uh, the starting point is always going back to very primitive stimulus that you would experience, for instance, in the womb, vibration, sound, and then evolve from there into motion perception. So we do proprioceptive stimulus, moving joints, deep tissue stimulus, deep uh, trigger point therapy in certain areas. Uh, as John was mentioning, some uh, electrical stimulation, which is basically tens and interferential type stimulus sound therapy, also using uh, cerebellar stimulation and uh, vestibular stimulation, brainstem stimulation. We also use what's called a direct current stimulus, which is a new sort of, uh, it's not new, it's been around for a while, but the application of it is now enhanced because of the technology that we now have. These are the types of uh, treatments that we actually use to alter the environment. Now, I'm going to give you just a couple interesting stories. The first one is a 12-year-old that came in, and this child was, the, the mother brought him in and said, look, he's he's been to like three different schools now. He's going to get kicked out of this school. We can't have this happen because there's no more schools around, and no other school is going to take him. Can you help him? Now, Right in the very initial examination, we didn't even need the EG or anything else, we saw that he had a very low threshold for his ability to move his eyes. So he couldn't read because every time he tried to follow a line, he would experience pain. Now, pain, he didn't understand that, that it was pain. He would just blink and his eyes would water and he had dyslexic glasses that he would wear, all, you know, the whole um, story that these kids usually come in with. About 12 weeks later, now the mother first noticed a change. The mother and father first noticed a change after three days. They said this kid actually sat down and built a model car, which he would have never done before. He would never have had the attention because his eyes are starting to, you know, he's not having pain anymore. But 12 weeks later, he comes in and he is so proud. And he has won the principal's award. He has won the sports award. He won the math award. He won, you know, all these awards, and this is a child that was going to get kicked out 12 weeks ago. And what you will notice when the brain starts to change, everything changes. It's not just sort of they come in and they say, well, he, he needs, you know, he can't talk. We, need, we want him to, to speak. The speech improves, but also the coordination improves and the ability to relate with other people improves and the ability to understand, you know, internal feelings and the whole spectrum. Yes of reality and life changes because the brain now starts to change. And interestingly enough, rashes start to go away. The immune system starts to become more regulated. Gut issues start to clear up. Constipation, diarrhea, those types of things start to go away. And I'm just going to tell you one more story because I don't want to hog the thing, but this, is, uh, this just happened. And uh, we have a family visiting from Hong Kong. Uh, and they have a 14-year-old boy who has autism. And he has had incredible changes, stark change. You would not believe the changes in this child in numerous areas. Yesterday, they said, we buy into this whole environmental stimulus thing. We're going to take him skydiving. <laughs> so they took him skydiving. And it was, it was amazing to see the change in, in, in the child when, when they finally got to the ground. But it was interesting. They said, do you want to do this again? And he said, no. <laughs> so he was totally white when he got up but they were trying to take it to the limit and change this environmental stimulus i don't know if i'd advise skydiving but they yeah. they tried it yeah 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 <laughs> maybe a bit too far which yes. is a lovely segue to you because that's what you'd like to do perhaps not skydiving but really bringing people to vastly new experiences too draw them out yeah and them. it's interesting holly that a lot of the the last few passages of conversation there's been elements of emotion and perception and all of that built in and i think you know one of the one of the very practical kinds of elements that i bring to the table is you know, i look at us 
human beings as a as a mechanism of survival and w- and when you look at us in that kind of state you know if we're under deep duress then our emotional state makes a big difference you know many of the people that die in the outback die because they're under pressure and and coronial reports will say things like their actions didn't make sense they were nonsensical um and it's because they're not acting rationally and and it's it's curious that we expect people both professional people practitioners support people etc around around somebody to respond to pressure in a very rational way but one of the things that we know is that when we get pressured when we get emotional um, particularly when we're pushed into that sort of fight flight or freeze kind of state we actually get more stupid um, frontal cortex shuts down we, we we're less able to access what we can and, and a lot of people come into the environment I think with a with a sense that I don't know and therefore I'm anxious about what I'm doing here as a professional person. So straight away they're on the back foot and they're trying ego, defensiveness, all of that sort of stuff comes into play. And then there's this assumption that the person's perception, what Randy was saying about perception, is that that for it to be okay, it's got to look the same as my perception. And one of the things that we fundamentally miss is that all of our perceptions are flawed. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what, where we come from, whether we happen to have a a label that somebody's given us on account of a diagnosis or not, all of our perceptions are flawed. We only see a fraction of what's around us. And it's so filtered based on our life experience and all of that. So a big part of the picture for me is building environments where people feel psychologically safe enough to step outside of what's usual for them and to to try new things on, you know, being able to build a sense of, you know, it's okay to have a go. It's safe enough to have a go, and so something like skydiving, you know, that's that's radical for pretty much any human being. You know, some mm-hmm. some of the research around around fear with um, magnetic resonance imaging of brains of people who never skydived before. You know, their frontal cortex shuts down for about five seconds. It's like they've had a lobotomy. Um, so we're we're putting people into really interesting places, and the only way that you can do that is to build enough of a sense of trust in the people around them and what's happening. I think if you if you try to take people into extremely different environments without doing that, it's just irresponsible, and I would say that's irresponsible for any human being, um, regardless of what label they happen to carry. But if you can do it in a way where activities are sequenced so people get an opportunity to build competence and experience and uh, comfort with what they're actually doing if there's opportunities to tap into how how is this person communicating yes or no so that you can say well here's a here's an evolution of that you know do you want to take a a bigger step into something even more unknown then and they're able to say yes or no uh, in whatever way they do that, whether that's eye movement, muscle movement, verbally, however they however they do it, and you can build that kind of picture of trust, then people will explore their edges. It's one of the things human beings are known for, right? We we like to get out and play with what can I achieve, what can I do, how can I make things easier or better or create more with what I've got, and you know, fundamentally, that stuff's hardwired into us from a survival point of view. Yes, yes. And what I love about your work is implicit in it is every single person, um, whatever aspects of their physical and mental being are not functioning at peak, um, everybody likes to go past their limits and do more mm. and will always do much more than anyone, well, a lot of people might perceive. Mm. I just think that's a, it's just a really interesting part of looking at disability and, in, and, and autism in that sense. I think what you're saying there about their limits is really important as well because often the the expectations and the limitations that are put on people are either really, really small because of the label that they hold. They go, right, if that person has autism or any other kind of condition, then we perceive that they're only capable of this. Or we go to the opposite extreme and say the only version of legitimate experience is for the, for this person to be able to do things the same as everybody else. So, you know, if we're, if we're actually saying, what's your experience? How does the world appear to you? Let's try and understand that and hear about your your unique perception. And for me as a professional, you know, part of, part of that process is saying, 
my perception is different to everybody else's on the planet. Um, you know, if we if we can just bin that idea that we're somehow all homogenous, and that was something that Randy was saying before, then we've got a really rich starting point to go, well, there's diversity all around us. Let's get curious about that rather than trying to put people in boxes and saying it has to look this way for it to be legitimate or OK or rational or logical and then explore where we can go from that. Yes, and then it gets thrilling and then you get results and you get very different results. Mm. Um, it's why I'm much more in favour of that kind of approach than a behavioural outcomes kind of approach because if you, if you know where you're going, you can't go anywhere half as interesting as if you start exploring. You're just ending up somewhere quite different and it's very client-driven then, which is where you know the, the personalised um, treatment comes in. You just, you just don't know. Like all of us here, in a sense, you just have to listen to each person and see where they, where they need to go next and the next step. Sanjeev, you've been listening to all of this. Have you got anything to add? I think I totally agree because what, what happens is that like majority of the time, until unless people are not in the window of tolerance, like there's sensor motor psychotherapy, there's an approach where it is told that other uh, person can be in a go in a flight mode or a freeze mode. And the reality is that if our ventral vagus is regulated, then we are going to be in a window of tolerance. Now, what we are really talking about is that trying to regulate that branch of vagus nerve, which is going to help us to regulate our emotions, our connections and everything. And we don't panic or become anxious. Now, but certain times what happens is that like majority of these, any psychotherapy approaches, there's no problems with any of them. But when we are not putting that into a perspective of that particular individual and don't work, there's a very likely chance that there's a failure. I can give you an example of, of a person who has got a schizophrenia now and uh, he's been managed by a public mental health system and he had a history of uh, a substance use disorder which resulted in a psychotic episode resulting in a schizophrenia. This is a pattern which John would agree that this is not an uncommon which we see all the time. He eventually ended up on clozapine which is one of the most potent antipsychotic and is well aware that although this is a very good medication, but it comes with a lot of side effects. Now, this person had an issue around anxiety or a social anxiety, particularly when he was going out in the dark. And secondly, if he has to face some group of people whom he was not comfortable <coughs> with. Now, when we started working together, he came to know about my kind of approach and then said like, okay, I'm not going to stop your medications because this is not something, it's not like either all, it is something which we are going to combine. One of his wish was that he wanted to watch a, a match in Boxing Day in Melbourne. And ever since we started working on his biochemistry where we make jump changes in his diet and also we went for his stool examination and prescribe some changes, some specific probiotics and gut lining agent. So in reality, what I've done is that he had a wish. He wanted to do something or accomplish something. So he was willing to try, but he could not succeed because what happens is moment he was put up in a, in an overwhelming anxious situation, his psychotic symptoms would flare up, not to a point that he would require an admission. But he would he would just decompensate and just retract back. And this was a pattern which was going on. Now, this man on Boxing Day successfully went to Melbourne and watched the match for the whole day. <laughs> and he not only sat down in few group of people, he sat down in among 50, 60,000 who were there. And it was such an excitement on his face when he came back. And so much rewarding, like it is, and that kind of approach could have never been achieved uh, if you would have done a traditional way. So that's what we are talking about, that all modalities which are going to be what we call as complementary, if they are combined together, I have no reasons to say that the efficacy of these all complementary approach will be several folds than our standard intervention. Uh, the common thing, that, that, like Mike was saying about when you 
expand someone's environmental adventures, they invariably are proud. Yes. Mm. And, you know, like you were talking about this guy in the, you know, he did what he wanted to do and he was proud. The yes. child that, you know, didn't get thrown out of school, the pride on, mm. on his face. The person who cooked the breakfast, obviously, I would assume, mm -hmm. was proud Absolutely. of what they did. So you cannot take the environmental stimulus and separate it from the emotional result that happens. So if you don't understand your environment and it's not being processed properly, you have an emotional expression problem or perception problem also. Yes, and a huge <clears throat> esteem problem, self-esteem, mm. which you start building all the other capacities are the, the self-esteem just rises astronomically doesn't mm. it and you can have multiple as we're saying approaches to that but at the end of the day the person becomes full mm. so yeah just following on from what randy was saying that a big part of the picture is about how people with disabilities whatever particular label they carry they tend to be cotton wool so people are very averse to exposing them to any sort of risk and you know when I say risk I'm not sort of saying go out and do dangerous or silly things by any means but you know the average person gets to decide what their appetite for risk is you know whether they want to dive off cliffs with wingsuits or whether a risk for them is actually just leaving their house or trying a new meal on the menu and I, I think that's a really important part of the picture is that we give people the opportunity to to test things out that are new for them Randy was talking about pride and that sense of achievement and, and risk is a big part of where we get that. You know, we learn where our personal boundaries are. We learn what stretches us. We learn where we're comfortable and where we're not. And we get to push those edges when we get to take risks. And, and a lot of people just get denied that because it's seen as, as too scary, too risky. Things like duty of care get bandied around a whole lot as the reason why not. Um, and again, I think, you know, the way to explore that in a way that is useful and relevant for people and also keeps them safe, it comes back to that communication that we were talking about as being very central before, you know, if people explore ways to communicate with people, even if they're in a linguistic minority of one, then they get to choose and to say this is working for me or not in whatever way suits them and, and to explore their boundaries and constantly push them back. And, and from there, they develop more and more and more of themselves. They get to see themselves at play and at work and in situations that they didn't anticipate, dealing with those dynamic environments, however big or small they are. And from that comes all of that self-confidence and pride and emotion that goes with it, which gives you the opportunity then to step out even further. And keep growing. Mm. The idea of risk I also was popping into my head while you we were talking in terms of choosing other therapies because we have a very sort of standard way of looking at autism in particular and certain therapies are the go-to. It's quite risky for parents to go and try new things. They generally do after they've exhausted all the other options. Can you talk a bit about that, Randy, in terms of the sort of the dominant paradigm for what people generally do with autism, being ABA, behaviour therapy, things like that, and how difficult it is for parents to shift gears and go down the route that you do, or Sanjeev, with your stuff as well. People sort of come to you after a while, don't they? Most of the people who come to see us have been to see at least six other clinicians or doctors before they come to see us. And they have they come to see us basically at the end of their rope. They've tried everything else. Now, that's how it used to be. Now, it's slowly changing so that we're now only third in line or something like that. But you are right. There are traditional therapies that have been traditionally given the, uh, the bona fide approach from whatever powers that be. Um, unfortunately, when you actually look at the evidence, a lot of these therapies don't stand up, just like any other uh, new therapy coming along probably has just as much evidence as any of these other therapies and may show better results. Now, as Sanjeev was saying, we can always have a combination of things. But I think the two biggest risks are, number one, that you apply a standardized approach to every child or every person, which doesn't work. And we've had these attempts before uh, I don't know if you remember the DOOR program that was uh, it put into all the schools at great expense. 
and every child received these exercises to do. And the problem with that was that uh, every child didn't need those exercises. In some cases, they were actually wrong. So there's an old saying, if you're paddling your canoe in the wrong direction, going faster doesn't make things better. So the same thing applies to this. You have to make sure that you have the right therapy for your child. How do you do that? The only way is to have individualized testing done, whether it's um, gut biome testing, genetic testing, EEG analysis, whatever you choose to do or do them all. But you have to have an individualized approach. If you don't, you're probably wrong more times than you're not. We'll probably wrap up quite soon, but could we go around? Is there anything anyone would like to add before we finish up? I think I would agree with Randy. And most of the time now I have started seeing some of patients who are referred by some of my colleagues because they are labeled as treatment resistant means, which means that they have been tried on all available pharmaceutical agents, psychotherapy, ECT, and all other treatment modalities. And now what we have is nothing is left. So what else you can do? And then when people are coming with this, uh, they are quite hopeless. And a lot of, lot of time they have been lost their jobs and also their... So I can give you a, a, a classical example of a patient who came to me about almost one, one and a half years back. And this person was had a treatment-resistant depression and was on combination of uh, a classical very strong antidepressant, which are we called as MAO inhibitors. Okay, We don't use them now often because there are a lot of dietary restrictions when we prescribe them along with lithium. This person has a successful family history of suicide and he was a 25-year-old man. In this pe uh, pe person, what my approach was that, okay, you have tried this, it hasn't worked. Now, if you are going to try something different, you have to be a bit patient because what happens is, a lot of times they have already lost their patience by trying different things. And and the key to success for any of these complementary modalities are not that they are going to be a quick fix. Okay, It has not come up in one day, it will not go in one day. And I always give them a broad that uh, that before you have been suffering from these illnesses from last so many years, please give a decent shot of 8 to 12 months before you say it has worked or not worked for you. This man agreed. We successfully were able to wean off some of his medications. We went for his metabolic screening profile. So I checked for his micronutrient status, his metabolism status, which we call as methylation status. And we never got a chance to check his biome because that time he could not afford it because that's again a test. Some of these tests are not covered by Medicare, which is a very unfortunate because a lot of times we can make a big change in their in the treatment approach if we have these things available. After we uh, gave a trial uh, of weaning off the medication and started these supplements, uh, some of them were nutraceutical agents. Within span of four days, this man slept for eight hours. This man was on Centrelink benefit. He was a liability to the society. Now he has gone back to work. Now he's an asset to the society. Now, the way we have been treating, we have been disability that they are a liability to our society. Okay, there is a possibility that there will be some, uh, we cannot make them able or join, make them to join the workforce. But if out of that bunch, if you are able to make some people able to earn a livelihood or at least boost their self-esteem or self-confidence, I think we have done the job. And I can quote this person and he's willing to speak about him in every forum because now almost one year down the track, he has gone back to workforce and working full time mm. and doesn't require Centrelink anymore. Very different outcome and actually not a very long space of time. Yes. A year isn't that long. Yeah. And I think it, what's interesting as well is just hearing what everyone's saying is it's this thing about expectations. And I think it cuts in two ways. It's expectations for patients and their families but it's also expectations amongst us as well, and clinicians and, and people doing, anyone who's working with people who are struggling with these kinds of issues, and we're talking about lots of different issues, but particularly autism, but we're talking about a range of things. 
But I think the trouble is we often, it is that thing about perception again, we all have our mindsets and we, we catch ourselves at times, I think, realising that we've closed down. Our expectations of this person in front of us are immediately starting to close down based because we're buying into other models or we're buying into an approach. And, and then every now and then we have an example and we think, oh my goodness, you know, I've probably closed down too many people because I haven't seen the potential because I haven't been prepared to just try that extra. Now, sometimes it's the person themselves walks away, but I think we as the people are trying to help and trying to open up new options. We've constantly got to keep that open mind. This person could possibly do well if I could, we can just get the right combination of things and look at it from a different angle and so on. So that's a challenge for us, as well as for patients, clients, consumers and so on, um, to keep that openness to human potential, because that's one of the things we touched on at the beginning. And it's not to buy into a sort of a slightly negative mindset, which I think in professional circles we can do because we can get a bit jaded at times. Mm -hmm. Agreed. When you find that spark of the person and you mm. work with them, yeah. it, it starts to flicker yeah. and grow and grow and grow, doesn't it? Yeah. Last words? Love Mike what you said there, John, around uh, just staying open-minded. For me, a big part of the picture is, is just remaining curious and we can we can shed light on our blind spots just by being curious about how other people see the world and you know i think one of the gifts of working with people who are who are different from how we are whether that's because they wear a label of some kind or they come from a different profession or whatever it happens to be is that we get an opportunity to be exposed to, to a different way of seeing the world and if we're genuinely curious about that Often we have those delightful human moments where we get a spotlight shone onto one of our blind spots and we have a glorious aha moment and we get to see the world in a whole different way. And, and part of the work that we potentially do for people is create those kinds of moments or deny those kinds of moments. So staying open-minded is a really big part of it, activating our curiosity, being, being like kids are, you know, really interrogating stuff and getting into it and trying to understand why and how things work. And for me, one of the benchmarks of that is is to just hold the filter of, you know, what, what will we think of this in 100 years' time? You know, we look back over 100 years when we were putting people with autism on old ship hulks out in Frio Harbour and we go, that's disgusting, how could we ever do that? And I often wonder what will it be like in 100 more years when they're looking back on the sorts of things we're trying now and saying, what were they thinking? You know, hopefully we just keep on evolving and getting better and better, and the only way we can do that is with curiosity. Curiosity, yes, and we are all the same because everyone's got a nervous system and everyone's got a way of perceiving. So you start playing with people in that way and you're, you're aligning with them. Then you find out what they think and then they find out what they think too, but you, you kind of can't miss if you go in from that angle. It's not always that easy with people with autism and you've got to pick your spaces but at the end of the day we are all the same aren't we just you know in our own quirky old ways thank you all so much for coming you're brilliant and i'm very excited to start to explore this issue some more i think it's really important i think it's really valuable i think we are evolving i think we will look back in a hundred years and be glad that about now we started to really turn things around and make make a lot of difference but also really appreciate human differences and, and who people can be and what they bring to the world. And I think that's, that's starting to become something that's quite, quite lovely. So thank you all very much for coming. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes part two of our two-part podcast on breakthroughs in autism. My name is Holly Bridges, and you can find more on my website. Just Google Holly Bridges. And don't forget to subscribe to this podcast for future editions. <laughs>